Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Dirt to Dust, another episode here on our our little podcast here. I'm your host, Doug Langford, along here uh, with Caleb Forbes once again. Caleb, welcome back to another episode. We're kind of getting used to this a little bit. Yeah, I feel like we're kind of, we might yeah, actually start acting like we know what we're doing. Just a little bit. Uh, it's still still kind of weird to be in front of the camera instead of behind the camera because this is this is new territory for me but uh and, yeah, and, and especially dealing with a little bit of bell's palsy and my face was kind of half paralyzed when we started the very first episode it was still the effects were there but i think i'm coming off of that i think i'm doing pretty good and i think we're doing this pretty well uh i noticed on the last episode uh, between uh apple podcast and youtube we had over 100 listens uh which is awesome um so i, I think huh. we're doing something right to start with this being so new and uh so we're gonna keep doing this dude i thought i thought about that when we first when i first texted you and i was like hey man i'm going over to best buy i'm replacing this and replacing that we're gonna do this again and i'm like you know what i realized i just texted him and he's like two days out of the <laughs> hospital <laughs> like, like man what a dick move that was but no you were 100 percent on board i was like well that's that made me feel a little bit better but dude i can't even like it's gone man yeah. like that's awesome it's, like it's, the so, speed so, which you have covered. So today is actually four weeks since I was in the hospital, um, which was That's the enough. estimated time frame. But some people yeah. actually deal with this a lot longer. I notice there's still some <laughs> lasting effects, um, but for the most part, I'd say I'm, I'm like 99 percent there. The worst of it, man, is uh, sudden loud noises. It actually like it starts messing with my equilibrium and my balance and it'll actually start canceling out noise on one side or the other in my head. That's kind of weird. Um, other than that, That's we're doing good. Going. That's it's that's insane. That's crazy. Well, uh, so yeah, let's get going here. Last week we talked about. Um, I had to think about this when I started talking to you this morning. I was like, "Holy oh, crap! What was last week's episode?" It just seems like it was so far away. But it, then I was like, "Oh yeah, we talked about cheap lift kits mm -hmm. with more stuff in them versus more expensive or, or higher quality lift kits with less in them." And I don't, I don't know that we really solved that battle, but maybe we, hopefully, we educated people about it. So uh, sure. I know what the the end of the episode, I kind of teased what was coming. And that was, we were going to kind of talk, start talking about research and development, what companies do, how companies do it, even down to like the shop environment and how shops, some shops can do mm. it. And then how that affects um, pricing, availability, different generations of parts, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, let's get, uh, let's get into this R and D thing and let's start talking about it. Let's get this, uh, let's get this episode of dirt to dust going. Other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off Road. If it's anything off road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to, to Dust. Us. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. <laughs> All right, all right, boys and girls, here we go. Uh, we said it uh, at the to cap or to start this thing off. We are going to be talking about research and development today. Um, I hope that this is not super crazy, insane, boring because I don't know. Hopefully, this is a topic that people will actually listen to and be like, "Oh, I didn't know that." Man. I, I, feel I don't like know. Maybe a lot of people it's don't you, like yeah. realize what this is and how important it is. Um, so I think. At, at minimum, I want to provide a little bit of understanding of why some things are more expensive that we touched on last week. And this was one of the topics that we hit that was, hey, this does make a product more expensive. Um, so anything that we can do to clarify some things, I think is good. Um, any, It might be a little more educational than you know, funny, but I think it's a topic that definitely needs to be hit on because it's going to provide some clarity to some people down the road. Nah, we'll have some laughs if people don't know what they're talking about. And we'll start there. Speaking of people that don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> Facebook groups. It's the reason for this episode, man. You get it all the time. You get all these groups and it's like, what's the best lift kit for this? And these people are just on there and they're just recommending what they have. And they're like, well, you know, they act as if the only difference 
is price. Right. Like, okay, I get it. You get on a website, you see a kit that's, you know, four ninety nine ninety five or two ninety nine, whatever it is, you know, coils, not coil space, whatever. But all these people are seeing is a number mm -hmm. and it's just so aggravating. I mean, I got up this morning and I, you know, I, I get up fairly early because I like to get into the office kind of before everybody starts working. I like to get some work done. I feel like I'm very productive. And I, you know, some of what I do is scroll the socials and I came across this post and I don't remember what it was on, but it was talking about just this super overgeneralized question. Mm -hmm. And it was a local group. It wasn't a national one. And usually I'm a little nicer on the local groups because, <laughs> you know, I don't want to be, you know, sometimes I do let it loose on the national ones just because, you know, I, it, it is kind of what sometimes it is, it right? Like I've, I've kind of, sometimes you just see a post. They do. Like, you just walk right like, out. Uh, you know, if you do come up to me and you happen to see me in Moab or somewhere out, you're like, you're, you made a mean comment to me on Facebook. I don't care. <laughs> like, I really right. don't. But, you know, I don't, I also don't want to be like a total jerk. So in my head, I'm thinking like, I could go for 10 minutes on this guy mm -hmm. and, and tell him why he's just absolutely flat out wrong. And I'm like, you know what? I don't have the time. <laughs> I just, there's just so much out there that is so bad. I'm like, you know what? I am really glad that we are filming a podcast today because hopefully, hopefully maybe someday down the road, somebody can link to this or one of these other episodes or something and it can, and it can do that. But yeah, I, I just, you know, that's, that's the whole point of this R and D episode is because people that just see a number and to everybody out there in La La Land, it is not just a yeah. number. There's so much into that number. So um, and we could get into a further that, episode yeah. with, Mater okay. Well, we talked about materials a little bit, but material, like how expensive the machinery yeah. is and how fine the lasers are that are cutting the steel, how, like you, you don't even like the companies out there that are having to pay a, an engineer to design these things. And that guy's salary might be well into the six figures just to just to design the parts that go under these things before they're even manufactured whatsoever. So I think all of that plays into. But first of all, um and just to kind of touch on our first point, what is, I mean, people will hurt here, R and D research and development, but what, what is R and D? So, I mean, obviously everybody knows what you hear the term R and D and everybody thinks science, science. or pharmaceuticals <laughs> or medical research, you know, science doctors do R and D and, you know, we're trying to cure cancer and that's all good. Like cancer sucks. I want to cure cancer just as much as the next guy. I'm not smart enough to do that. So I do off road things. Um, but in our market, in our industry, R and D is is it's really just two sides of the same coin. Side one is kind of in house R and D. Side two would be you know kind of in the field. Mm -hmm. um, in house R and D would be um, you know for those companies that do it in the U S. that do most of their stuff in the U S. Um, they're they're on their computer. They're on AutoCAD. They're on all of these programs that I don't know. Um, I hear names all the time thrown around. They're on these computer programs and they're physically drawing out these renders and these 3D models of parts. And then they're, you know, they're sending them out to sheet metal or they're doing them in house, whatever their capabilities are. And, and they're cutting and they're bending and then they're welding it up and they're testing it. And they're doing all of that stuff in house to test fitment um, and kind of how it works in 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 a shop or or you know, warehouse, whatever, industrial environment. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of internal R&D. And then obviously in the field's pretty self-explanatory. We're taking stuff. Once we've kind of done the in-house stuff, we're taking it out and we're beating on it. We're abusing it. That can be through as simple as some of these companies that you see organizing wheeling trips. Um, I, I'm here to tell you, yes, they like wheeling, but this is R&D for these guys, yeah. everyone, just so you know. Little secret. <laughs> I can tell you from experience where these companies are coming up with these wheeling events. Um, it's R and D. I, I'm, I can just tell you that right now. We'll, we'll dive into that with some specifics 100%. later. But um, yeah, that's kind of field R and D. Let's put it out on a trail. Let's put it on some rocks. Let's put it out racing. Mm -hmm. You know what we do? That's R and D for a lot of the companies that we've partnered with. Most of them, it is some form of R. Uh, of R and D. And again, we'll get into that a little bit later. So, you know, these guys are, you know, they're going, let's put it on the race car and see what happens. And if we can make an improvement or, cause they know that 99.99% of their customers are never going to do to their product, what I can do to their product in 4699 or any of the yeah, racers. So hours. they know if it holds up <laughs> there, or sometimes, sometimes less, uh, if it can hold up under those circumstances, then it, then it's going to hold right. up. But that's R and D you got in-house R and D and then field R and D. So what you're saying is, I need to design an outlaw off-road R&D department 
t-shirt for wheeling trips um yeah mm. <laughs> the, 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 the official abuse a little test too much. <laughs> a little too much early in the morning Hit me with that later in the week and later in the afternoon. Yeah, let's get a cup of coffee. I'm only one <laughs> cup of coffee and half a monster into this day. All right. I need at least another cup of coffee to, to move on that one. At uh, least. At least. So in that case, I mean, that sounds like a phenomenal idea and a phenomenal way to make sure your products are <clears throat> going to take the abuse and take and just last off the road, which is obviously what the end goal is. Um, why, why would companies choose to like not R&D their products? Because phenomenal also means phenomenally expensive. True. That is <laughs> true. It is it is time consuming and, and it is financially consuming. And if you as a company can say, well, I, I'm going to do the minimal amount of R and D for for two reasons. Number one, I want to get a product to market. Um, because I'm not making any money off of this product until I'm able to sell it. If I can't sell it to the end use consumer, then I'm not making a dime. Um, and the other one would be to be able to hit a price point. If my if my business model, um, and we all have business models, if my business model calls for me to be a certain type of company, I am a budget company or I am a low to intermediate price point company. Every one of these companies knows where they want to be and where they want to hit and how to get there. Then they're going to go, look, we have a X budget for R&D and some it's astronomical and some it's astronomically low um but it's not it's not a knock on that company it's just that's their space their niche in the market that's kind of their business plan their business model that's what they've said look we're just going to get we're going to get it as close as we can based on previous experience with previous vehicles previous models and and we're going to get close and maybe we're good it's why you'll see some companies kind of known for being good for certain vehicles and not for others it's because they they got it good. They got it pretty good on the first swing and they may nail it on the first swing. They may miss. The problem is that even if they miss, they're not going to make too many changes. You know, I'll, I'll, there's a couple of companies out there and, and there's lots of them to do it. So I won't I won't name one. When the JL Wrangler came out in 2018, there was this race to get product to the market. Yeah, everyone wanted to be some of them the hit the market very mm -hmm. and, well. I Some wanted to be first yeah, to market. Some deliberately did not but the ones that wanted to be first to market, they, they kind of went based on um, what they saw in the JK. And you could approach that two ways. Metal Cloak, for example. I will, I'm not hitting on Metal Cloak, but I'll see what they did. When Metal Cloak first came out, we all kind of knew, and, and even Rock Crawler did this to a certain extent. We knew very quickly that you could put a JK front coil spring on a JL. And the difference was one inch. So if I put a three and a half inch spring, I was going to get... Two, I was going to get an extra inch of, of lift. So if I put a two and a half inch JK spring on the front of a jail, I was getting about three and a half inches. These are rough numbers. Nobody does it anymore, by the way, but we did this back then. On the back, we found out we could put a TJ spring back there. And the difference was about two inches under just because of the weight TJ versus JL. So we could put a TJ, like a five and a half inch TJ spring in the back. We were getting like three and a half inches of lift. Now we were getting ride heights right. And it was riding down the road. Um, it wasn't riding down the road amazingly well. Now, if you had a company that had a JK coil dialed in and a TJ coil kind of dialed in, then they were getting close. So at that point, you're, if you're a company, you're at a fork in the road. You go, okay, my R&D budget says I can't really do anything else. Is this where I stand? Do I stick here? And some companies did. And they didn't develop anything else. And, and they put a kid out. And, you know, for aesthetics, they're fine. And for everything else, they're kind of, eh. And it really just depended on how good they were on JK and TJ stuff. Companies then like Metal Cloak and Rock Crawler came out and said, okay, this is what we're going to do to get a kit out. Agree with it, disagree with it, right, wrong, indifferent. I, you know, we're all in business at the end of the day, and we can't wait three years to put a product to market, right? So then Metal Cloak kind of went down the middle of the road, and they kind of said, okay, we're gonna, this is what we're going to do. And people called them out for it. And I'm like, I mean, I get it kind of to an extent. But it really, it wasn't that much of a difference to be like, yo, you guys suck. You shouldn't be a bit. It wasn't that bad. Because um, a lot of companies did this. A lot of, more than you'll ever know did that. And then they developed new stuff. They developed JK specific, or JL, sorry, JL specific stuff. Um, and then they kind of re-released. They kind of, you know, as it, as it went, 
And now for at least for the last several years, it's been JL specific. This wasn't, this didn't go on very long. Rock Carlo did the same thing. Rock Carlo goes to kind of a, is an example of going even further where they put out that first edition of the kit and then they put out a second and then they put out a third and then they change the joints and put out a fourth. Like Jeremy Zurich is like, dude, this guy, man, <laughs> this guy's brain works differently. And he's always putting out new skews and they're changing joints and they're doing this and they don't mind saying, look, we understand, you know, they sticker, their sticker colors are different by year at rock crawler. If you look at a rock crawler part that you bought and it can be a red sticker, a blue sticker, a purple, they didn't just decide they wanted to rainbow out their stickers. Everyone. That's how they know. That's how, you know, looking on a shelf, what year that sticker was from or what, what edition that part was from. And we can tell by looking at that color of sticker, uh, how recent a model that that part is. So, you know, that's kind of on the extreme end of R and D and constant trying to improve and evolve, you know, metal clip kind of right in the middle of kind of do, I, you know, they're doing it the right way, get a kit out, understanding that you're going to do better then do better. And that's kind of your kit. Um, and then there's a, obviously a ton of other companies that just kind of throw out the first one, get it as close as they can. And that's where mm -hmm. it's at. And that's reflected in those companies price points. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I also remember pretty early on, <clears throat> it had to have been within the first generation of the JL kit um, that Jeremy and Rockcrawler, <clears throat> excuse me, that Jeremy and Rockcrawler uh, also realized there was some significant coil bow inherent to the JL. And they also designed a uh, coil isolator at the bottom to fix that bow. So yep, that's, yep, that's a pretty did, cool example of, of seeing what works with your product and quickly... Um, offering a solution knowing that we're going to deal with this and there's no way around it, but here's what you got to install. Here's how you install it. We're going to incorporate it into our install guides. So to me, it's really cool to see a company respond that quickly and then continually push themselves to, to make it better. Uh, now that does come with a headache, like you said, updating every year or every two years or whatever they, however many updates they come out with. Um, Couple but at the same time, whatever. the people who are buying the new, newest iteration are always getting the like the best that Rock Crawler can give them. And two, I want to say that Jeremy has always made the kits upgradable. Um, so if there's something else better out there a couple of years down the road, you can you know you can swap joints and you can you can replace things. And so and yeah, 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 yeah. If I wanted to take my X Factor joints out of something that I bought six years ago, you know, OG, oh, the arm is still the same. It's still the same old rock crawler, solid steel. And and most companies are like this. Um, they're going to keep their same dimensions where you can rebuild an, a new joint style into an old joint housing. They're going to keep the same that, that same drill out, that same diameter to basically screw in an adjustable joint. That thread pitch and that diameter is still going to be the same. So you can just take your arm out, unscrew the old joint, throw it in the scrap bin put the newest, the latest and greatest in there and you're rocking and rolling for a fraction of what it would be. So they're not just leaving people in the dirt, but you know, again, you're still having to do your R and D within that too. You can't just design an entirely new arm without pissing off a lot of people. So you got to make sure that you're doing that, doing everything you can within the confines of what you've kind of already done in the past. And you know, that's, that, that has, that has its pluses and its minuses like right. everything but on, on the plus side, like we mentioned in a previous episode, those joints, I mean, regardless of how good they're advertised at some point to to the extent of your abuse on it is going to be a wear and tear item so at some point that's going to have to be replaced anyways oh, sure um so why not get the latest and greatest when you when you go to replace it which is pretty cool yeah but if you think about from a marketing standpoint think when metal, when metal cloak came out and on that when they put the the, the jl kit out in Oh, when did I first get that? Um, we'll talk about shop R&D in a little bit, but I I, put, I I got that probably mid-2018, something yeah, like that. Pretty, you're pretty it was one of there. It was one of the first kits they put out, and it was when they were doing the JK. It was when they, it was it was early enough to where the front coils were still JK mm -hmm. coils. I think it was a JK coil front, and then it was uh, they had done a JL-specific coil for for the mm -hmm. rear. Um, and I remember that, but I remember their, their big thing being maintenance-free joints. Right. Um, and that was a huge, huge thing. I cannot remember how many times, and this went on for three or four years where metal cloaks, big selling point, at least to the general public, it may not be what they were pushing. Well, they kind of were too, um, was maintenance free joints, you know, set it and forget it kind of thing. They, you know, it was the do it for me, not necessarily lazy, but that part of the market that was like, I want, I want a quality 
U.S. produced brand, but I don't want to do, I don't want to, you know, have to do, you know, rock, rock crawling things that are, you know, a ton of maintenance on joints and rebuilding and replacing. I want something maintenance free. So Metal Cloak got on that really early and they were smart to do so where they said, look, we're going to be, this is going to be a big improvement to what you bought from the factory, but it's going to be maintenance free. You're not having to rebuild joints every year. You're not having to grease them up all the time. And, you know, that's where they got ahead. Um, I think they were actually ahead for a long time of pretty much everybody else in the JL game for sure was because of that. You know, they had that unique marketing because they're, they're zinc coated, right? Everybody knows that, that they have that very, um, it's very visible. You know what it is. Um, and you can have a, you can have a conversation about their quality and their build and what they do and how they do it all you want. But from a marketing standpoint, they absolutely hit pay dirt with continuing, obviously the gold, the zinc plated, you know, goodness that they, that they, that they produced. Um, and it's not bad product. Um, is there worse out there? Absolutely. Is there better out there? Absolutely. But it was good, solid product. And then to, to go maintenance free to understand the market really before the market started to turn, they were doing it before COVID yeah, for sure. and COVID kind of changed that for a lot of people, but metal cloak was already there. So all they had to do is be like, Hey, we're just going to keep doing yeah, what we're doing. The marketing team and was on it for that. Maintenance free, and they're hammering on maintenance free. And it took everybody else. It took some other companies a few years to catch right. up. Um, but by then metal cloak already had that, that foothold mm-hmm. and they continue to possess that that big market share in the JL and JT market because right. of that. So and so we've touched on Metal Cloak and, and Rock Crawler, but um are there what other companies that it's like pretty obvious that they they spend some time in R and D and not just in the Jeep world too. I want to talk about um outside Jeep world, we deal with Tacomas, Tundras, Ford, Chevy's um but we deal with everything and i think we've even lowered some vehicles as sacrilegious as that sounds but um, uh just for the full spectrum of of our you know the industry that we deal with including not just suspension but also bumpers armor stuff like that um are there some clear companies that like hey these guys absolutely spend some time in r&d Yeah, absolutely. And, and several come to mind when you talk about suspension um, and and all these companies do Jeep suspension, but the ones I'm thinking of Jeep specific JKS manufacturing is one um, that a lot of people don't think about. I know a lot of those guys at JKS, of course, that's a Fox affiliated company. um, And I know a lot of those guys and what they do to those vehicles um, from the Fox and specifically there are specific guys at JKS that go out and beat on this stuff, um, that JKS does. So JKS is one that comes to mind. Um, BDS suspension, another Fox affiliated company more on the truck side. Mm-hmm. I, you know, they may not like me saying this. I don't look to them a lot when I think Jeep, I just mm-hmm. don't, um, right, wrong or indifferent. I, I just don't with all the Jeep stuff that I'm so super familiar with. And BDS is just not something that I've gone out there and, put my brain to a lot um, for whatever reason, but BDS is absolutely, you know, at the top of the game for truck stuff. They do a lot of R and D, you know, they've got that. No questions asked, you know, lifetime warranty again, another Fox affiliated company. So you, you can trust the quality there. That is their top level stuff on truck. They're, they're like a, you know, their, their ride quality is every bit as good as a Carly or, uh, or any of that. Carly obviously has a much a much more limited um, skew house, right? They they don't they don't they don't put stuff on nearly as much as BDS, but BDS is one. And then kind of on the yes, they make suspension for everything, and it's pretty good. But where they really shine is Toyota's Icon. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, Icon absolutely. is another one that would that would love. You know, you call them up and say, "Hey guys, I just bought this. I did it. You know, I just bought this Tacoma. I've got like five weeks to build it. We're going to go out and film this thing in Utah." And they were like. Dude, what can we put on it? Like, that's what we, that's where we want to be. We want you go out there and do it, you know, cause we were going out. That was when we were filming, um, uh, that Moab trip with the, the, the mighty five. And we were doing, you know, five days with five national parks and we didn't see a whole lot of pavement. No. And I had that Tacoma, no. but a, I think it was just an icon middle of the road. It wasn't a stage one, stage two. Icon, of course, goes all the way up to stage 15,379,000. Realistic, I think it's like, like a stage, stage four, four or five is like their top end, most expensive. Oh, no, they go up to like eight, oh, really? nine, 10 now. Okay. No, uh, well, when you start talking you about, <laughs> it's what we talked about last week when we were talking about quantity and right. quality, they're just adding quality. Okay. It's all the same stuff. They're just adding quantity of parts um, depending on what you do. And I think it was like a stage five Icon kit. 
And uh, then we took it out and we, and we did it and then and the truck performed they great. Did. So, um, and they yeah. do that stuff too. They do it all the time. So that's another one. And there, and there's more out there um, that do that. Curry enterprises mm-hmm. is one. Um, they actively pursue people to go and test axle stuff with and different brackets and different geometry and different circumstances and, you know, traditional center sections versus fabricated center sections. That's another one that does that. Um, so there's, there's tons of them out there. And that's a couple that, that come to mind on the armor side. I think next venture motorsports only because I have, I have a firsthand knowledge of those guys. Dude, you have not seen somebody get more excited <laughs> when I break their stuff than Dan. Dude, I, I nailed one of their rear bumps. I like no rear bumper would have survived mm. this. And there's actually kind of did, but I put this big bump, I put this big dent in the middle of the rear bumper and they come up to the tent after I come back from running and they're like, they're jumping up and down. Like, Oh, that's exactly what we needed. That's awesome. That's the best. We're going to put a gusset here. And I'm like, not only were they looking at it, but they found a point where they could improve and they were already talking about how they could make it better and what they were going to do. And they're like, dude, we're going to send you an RMA. We need you to send that back. We're going to hang this up in the <laughs> lot. I'm just going to send you a new bumper. But I want that bumper back. They did the same thing last year with the uh, the corner armor that Mick Henson just mm-hmm. drilled Jeremy in it. That came to the Hammers 2023. And they were like, dude, we want that back. We're going to hang it up. They, you know, they want they, it. They, they want, want that stuff. Off. So they want that. So smoke. Next Venture was actually at the lake bed with you during Hammers. That's Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. For That's- for several that, days that's a whole they were level in, of commitment they were because i mean for one it's it's already a big deal to for a company to sponsor a car like that in a race car and to get the exposure off of that uh and to trust that you're going to test it and represent them well but it's a whole new level of commitment to say hey look we're all the way in colorado we're going to take some time come out to the lake bed hang out with you and then personally see what happens to our stuff that's awesome like Kudos to, to Next Venture for doing that because that's that's a huge. Well, and that's why I love some of these companies we get. We over half of our actual sponsors on forty six ninety nine were at KOH. That's incredible. You know, Raceline was actively there, going around and looking at stuff. Mickey Thompson was actively there. AccuAir was there. American Iron Rock Crawler was in the main pits, running our pits all day. Um, Next Venture Motorsport, these guys were there getting it done. You know, Garrett from Perry Enterprises, they were, you know, they were, th- they were there and they were local. So they were calling, hey, I'm coming out. Do you mean to bring anything? Like they were bringing stuff to the pits. Like I wasn't there. He dropped it off, called me later and goes, hey, I just want to make sure you got what I needed. Like these guys were just, I love marketing partners like that because they're so involved. That's R&D for them. And, and they take it seriously and they want to make sure that, Hey, if we're going to do this, let's maximize our, uh, our efforts here and get every last ounce of good quality R and D that we can. And I, I, I just, I love all those guys for it. They're awesome. And I just, man, they make, they make racing more fun <laughs> for sure. Um, so with that, though, obviously those, those guys are not doing that for nothing. They are, they're getting something out of that. So what does, what does them being at the lake bed or having that relationship with you or in, in, really dialing the R&D, how does that ultimately and overall affect the, the retail pricing? I mean, everything costs mm-hmm. money, right? If, if, if Dan for, you know, the founder or owner of next venture motorsports is going to leave um, Grand Junction, Colorado and go to the lake bed, there's costs mm-hmm. involved. Um, you know, he's got to have fuel to get out there. He's going to have to get a hotel or a campsite or something. If I destroy one of their bumpers and they put a new bumper on the race car and they take that one back for R&D, the material and all that to make that bumper that both the bumper that I destroyed and the bumper that I'm now putting on the race car costs money. Um, so everything, everything costs money. When, when Jeremy Pure from Rock Hard Suspension goes and spends two weeks on the lake bed and, and, and organizes, you know, that rock crawler team, which we're proudly a part of, obviously, that costs money, um, you know, just – he just listed Jeremy just listed his toter home and his trailer on on Facebook for sale, which has been kind of that rig, that event rig for them for the past God knows how many years. Three hundred sixty five thousand dollars to get rid of that. Um, now I guarantee you pay more than oh, that absolutely. for it. So there is a certain amount of money that he's going to take as a loss to do that, and that has to figure in. So if if I go back to what I said at the beginning, if that's your if that's your business model and that's your plan, and you say, look, I am going to be on the cutting edge of R and D because I want to have cutting edge ride quality, cutting edge product longevity, cutting edge quality, cutting edge, everything that's going to cost money. And every, everything you spend has to go in. It has to, it has to go into the, the cost, the product, 
Because if it doesn't, if you can't spend that money, then you're not doing that stuff. Like I, I think Jeremy would be the first one to tell you that he has learned an infinite amount of knowledge from racing. Um, 2024 was not his first King of the Hammers. 2021 when 4699 was built was not his first King of the Hammers. You know, he's been doing this for 10 plus years racing all over the country. Again, not just KOH, you know, he, he drove the car, the 4699 at Crandon three years ago and won that race. He drove it in, he drove 4899, you know, so that's all been done for years and years and years and it all costs money. So whether it's flying out to a race, whether it's having a race team, whether it's just building a part, not liking it, throwing it away, building another one, everything from cost of materials to labor to weld wire. I mean, everything costs money. And if you're on that side of the market, it has to go into the price. If you're on the other side, the entry level of product, you have to curtail those costs. You have to vary. You have to be very on top of those costs to not, spend those things so that you don't have to increase your price because your business model is the exact opposite. Not saying one's wrong or one's right, but they're just different. They're completely antithetical to each other, but they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. And depending on which end of the spectrum you're on, you know, you got to either, you're either watching those costs or you're adding those costs one way or the yeah. other. All right. So with all that said, um, clearly, you know, R and D definitely affects the end user. It's, it's important on the front side. Um, other than price. And I think this is something that a lot of people need to hear because price, that's usually the first thing people look at. <clears throat> they say, Oh, $3,000. I'm not paying that for a suspension. Uh, but then they go on to say, Oh, I want to take it on the baddest trails. I want to go to the Rubicon. I want to do every trail at wind rock. Like, so you need this stuff. So, other than price, why should a customer care about the R&D process? I mean, some shouldn't. I mean, that, if we're being okay. honest, some customers should. I mean, if you're, if you're going out and the only thing you care about is aesthetics and your only goal is to get X size tire on there and – you know, again, we talk about the four questions. If, if you're zero to 10 of, I care about ride quality was a three, four or five. And your intended use was, I just want it to look cool. Um, then I, I don't know that you do care. Um, we can disagree about that. And I think you should, um, you know, that I see it on the face. Why I see it on Facebook. Why are you going to spend $60,000 on a vehicle and then put a $400 lift kit on it? Okay. I mean, that's a valid argument. I get it. And, and I probably side with you, but, uh, but, on the other side of that, I mean, if you're really not, if you're, you know, if you're going to be the industry standard, you're going to keep the car two and a half, three years, and you're not going to go out and wheel it. And, you know, the, the most off-road it's going to see is some speed bumps at the grocery store. I, I don't know how much you really care about getting into that and going down that rabbit hole. It's blue pill versus it's blue pill versus red pill. I think the real kind of line of demarcation comes when you tell me you're going to use four low. Like if, if you're going to put that vehicle in four wheel drive and you're going to go do things with it, now we start having to have a conversation of how deep down that rabbit hole are you going to go? Because you need, you need a suspension or you need an armor company or you need lights or you need anything that's going to go with you down that path. You know, so um, I think at that point you start having the conversation about, you know, the companies and maybe we're, you know, as, as a salesperson or somebody selling that kit to a customer, I'm probably not going to have the R and D conversation. That's a little bit kind of too much in the weeds, but we are definitely going to have the quality. And to me, quality is, is inextricably linked to R and D. I mean, the more R and D you do, the more quality R and D you do, the better your product's going to be and the better your product is, the higher quality you are. So and the better that's going to be if you come and tell me, well, I got to build my Jeep for a trip to the Rubicon next year, or I'm going out to Colorado. Well, I'm going to, we're going to talk about some different brands. And I'm in my head, I'm already going to the people that have done the R and D and I know their parts are going to make it because at the end of the day, if you go out there and you break, cause I sold you a cheap kit, you, you might should have blamed the company who built the <laughs> kit, but you're going to blame me. Like, it's just, is what it is. Like, I, I, there's no way around it. And I can bitch about that. And I can be mad about that, but it just is the world that we live in. So I need to at least try to educate the customer on what I would suggest and why. Now, what they do with that information, totally up to the end user, completely up to them. It's their car, their truck, their Jeep, their money. I, I can't control people's bank accounts. Um, but I can at least educate people and say, look, this is, this is what, and this is why. 
And then you make that call. And then, you know, whatever the end result is, is now their responsibility, not mine. But I got to at least, I got to at least try and do kind of what you're paying me, kind of what you're paying me to do. Yeah, absolutely. Because we do R&D. Yeah, too. absolutely. As shop, we do R&D. Yeah. I've done way too much R&D, uh, but I'll continue to do yeah. that. And which is why I brought up the t-shirt comment earlier, because I think all of us that are a part of the Outlaw brand, I think we do a very good job at at not being the end user who just puts it on, puts a suspension on, puts a piece of armor on, puts lights on, whatever, and just forgets about it. I think we, we use every single product that we buy and that go on our rigs uh, pretty extensively. Um, some more than others, but I mean, I, I can't think of a single shop that doesn't go out at some point throughout the year and absolutely hammer on their shop rigs, uh, which I think is important for us to know also what brands that we like to use, what are we going to use on our personal rigs? What do we trust uh, and move, move that onto the customer for sure. And I'm sure customers that go wheeling with us are going to see that and then ask, oh, why do you use next venture? Why do you like Baja designs? You know, why do you like rock crawler? And uh, you're like, Hey, watch this. <laughs> um, well, it's just, it's going along with what I said about rock crawler and always trying to improve. You know, we didn't, you know, I bought a JL when they first came out and within I don't know, within six months, I had put probably 20 different lift kits on it. Um, you know, different springs, different shocks, what worked, what didn't work, what, you know, what shock extended length worked with what, you know, the, the drive shaft, right? when do you replace the front drive shaft, all that kind of stuff. And then we built it up to go, okay, well, let's test the strength of these axles. Let's put 40s on, you know, stock axles, stock-ish, we built them up, but um, still stock housings. Let's do that kind of stuff. And we did that. And then you know, as that kind of went down, then we had, you know, we had Gerald in Huntsville buying Carnage and he was building Carnage a different way than I had built Reaper and was going out with the whole cage and with the 60s and then the 80s and all this kind of stuff. And then I said, OK, well, now we've done all that. Let's build Reaper with fabricated tail. Let's go. Let's go huge. And then, you know, that kind of went away. And then we had we've got, you know, Candace in Nashville who just took delivery of the 392 there. So they're going to build a three a factory 392. We had John in Gulf Coast who had he had a 392. So. And then I just, you know, we talked about last week, I had gone out cheap mm -hmm. shopping. I bought an, I bought another one, which we'll, um, we'll talk about, you know, so I want to <laughs> talk later. about that one soon. I'm excited for that one. And the whole reason I bought this Jeep was, you know, I, in that meantime, I bought the gladiator back in 2021 mm -hmm. when they came, you know, right after they came out, bought the gladiator, Hemi swapped it, but kept the stock out. You know, we wanted to see, I'm always, I'm always trying to find stuff that I can do that I think the market either wants to do or is going to want to do. And I want to try to do it first, you know, let us, you know, it's kind of like, don't do stupid stuff to your Jeep people. Let, let us do it first. first. Let us test it like, out. let me do it. I have no problem doing that. Right. Let, let's see if it works. So I'm, I'm really excited about the new Jeep because it is something that no outlaw shop has ever done. I've not done it. No other shop has done it. No employee in the company, no manager, no, nobody has done what we're going to do um with this new jeep in moab in about i don't know eight yeah. weeks nine weeks ten weeks whatever it's that is soon. um it's gonna be freaking awesome i can't wait i hope it i hope, I hope awesome. it works <laughs> well i think uh i think that about wraps it up for today i think any more conversation on r d just turns into more of a dry educational academic uh, kind of textbook thing uh i'm glad we hit on this though because this is definitely some new it, it got me some viewpoints that i wasn't even thinking about um but speaking of R&D, and you mentioned Next Venture, uh, what do we got coming up for a, a show soon? So I, I just emailed them this morning, actually. We're trying to get the schedule to get it ready for next week uh, or maybe the week after. But we have secured Dan Four, owner of Next Venture Motorsports. We're going to be interviewing him and we are going to cover um, we're definitely going to cover the R&D because, again, we just had this episode and I really want to hit on it with him because they are. They are one company that is heavy, heavy into the R and D, and I think people will be interested to kind of hear that side, the company side, and his side of what they do, how they do it, why they do it, kind of what benefit they get from it, and all of that. So um, we are working on getting that scheduled. Of course, he's out in Grand Junction, Colorado, a little bit of a time difference, and we are also trying to get some on the back end. We are trying to get some parts on back on forty six ninety nine because. 4699 has to be at opening weekend for the Carolina Cobras National Arena Football League uh, game here in about three weeks. And I'll be honest, um, I haven't unloaded the race trailer from King of the Hackers. 
That's fair. That's not gonna fair. lie. Like we just I've just been yeah. busy. Like it just ain't what it is. So uh we gotta get that unloaded. We gotta get some parts coming in. Um so we we just, you know, we gotta get that done. So we're trying to work out that schedule to get him in um when we can meet with him and, and sit down for, you know, forty five minutes yeah. to an hour yeah. and really pick his brain about I'm his side of it. He's, so pretty he's excited. One of the about guys it. that I've I've definitely wanted to kind of pick his brain about too. And especially hearing firsthand experience on R and D design, how you know, they're, they're starting to finish process on, on what they do, which I don't want to spoil anything. We haven't asked these guys any questions yet, so I don't know what we're even going to ask them yet, but I know that is coming up and I definitely want to let everyone know that we've got some it's really cool stuff. interviews it's coming up stuff. and that is the first of many very cool interviews that yep. I'm, I'm yep. super excited about. We'll tease the next one after. For sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> that hopefully we can get that up for next week's episode if not you know we'll talk about something else um we could always use ideas make sure you know like comment subscribe to the podcast but in those comments drop us some lines on on some issues or some topics that you guys might like to hear us talk about you know if we can go in kind of go in depth on something you might want to um might want to see might want to hear about so definitely uh like the podcast review it give us all the all the feedbacks and make those comments about stuff you'd like so that we can so that we have ideas so for episodes we, if i have to push so that we can do our own so. r&d and make this show better <laughs> you, you just went there, <laughs> just went there. <laughs> oh i guess we do need yeah. to talk outlaw r&d teacher all right that's all i've got for for this episode uh, i think it was a good one um we definitely we definitely covered a wide range of stuff in the R and D uh, atmosphere, hemisphere, some of them and them fear, whatever. Um, can't wait to do it again next week, whether that's the interview with Dan or another topic, we will be back regardless. Don't forget Friday, uh, the mailbag drops again, where we answer your questions or just some really random, stupid stuff that we found on the internet. Cause there's plenty there's of it, plenty out, of it there out there in the Friday mailbag. All right, guys. Caleb, outstanding as you, as always. I uh, look forward to doing it always. again. That is all I have. I am ready to check out. We will see everyone next week. You've been listening to Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off Road, the premier off road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, to see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it.